väittelijä on tänään filosofian maisteri Isaac Moss ja vastaväittäjä professori Helen Rieper Free University Amsterdam tiedekunnan määräämänä kustoksena julistan maisteri Isaac Mossin väitöstilaisuuden alkaneeksi. Honored Kustos, honored opponent, honored audience members. Each year, approximately 300 million people worldwide are affected with depression, making it one of the leading causes of disability today. Depression has been identified as a risk factor for many chronic health conditions. It's associated with poor quality of life and has substantial societal and economic impact. Psychotherapy has been demonstrated to be effective in the treatment of depression for all age groups and all levels of depression severity. Psychotherapy is as effective as medication in the short term, most likely more effective in the long term, and has less unwanted side effects. Moreover, the majority of patients prefer psychotherapy as their first line treatment for depression. However, despite this demonstrated efficacy, less than one in five people in high income countries and less than one in 27 in low and middle income countries who need care receive appropriate treatment, giving rise to what has been labeled the treatment gap in mental health care. Now, whilst there are many barriers to accessing care, one of the most significant is the dominant model of psychotherapy. This dominant model is characterized by one-to-one -one in person treatment delivered by a highly trained mental health professional and typically held within a clinical setting. Now, there are a number of challenges with the dominant model. Chief amongst them is the fact that we simply don't have enough trained mental health care professionals to meet the growing demand for treatment. In the US, for example, there are only 30 psychologists and 17 psychiatrists for every 100,000 people. At best, enough to meet 25% of the demand for treatment. Digital interventions have been proposed as a scalable, cost-effective way to meet the growing demand for psychological treatment and address many of the challenges associated with the dominant model. Digital interventions typically package up the core components of psychotherapy, for example, cognitive restructuring or behavioral activation in CBT, into digital media such as videos, interactive exercises, or text, and then deliver them as structured programs online via the internet or via a smartphone app. Interventions typically last six to 12 weeks and are designed to be either self-guided, where the onus is on the individual to complete the program, or as guided interventions, where they are accompanied by minimal human support, such as brief weekly emails or messages within the platform from the therapist. Now, over the past few years, there's been a significant growth in the adoption of digital interventions across both public and private healthcare settings, rapidly accelerated in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the UK, for example, the National Health Service now offers digital interventions as first-line treatment for mild to moderate depression and anxiety. And earlier this year, Scotland became the first nation in the world to offer a smartphone app as a prescription for the treatment of insomnia. And other countries are now following suit. At the same time, however, over the past decade, several large-scale trials assessing the effectiveness of digital interventions in real-world settings have concluded that digital interventions may offer no clinical benefit over and above the usual treatment an individual receives in primary care. So given the rapid acceleration of digital interventions across the world and some of the conflicting findings from individual studies, I began my thesis with the largest and most comprehensive meta-analysis of digital depression interventions conducted to date. 
In it, I address the following questions. First, are digital interventions effective in reducing symptoms of depression? Critically, how effective are they compared to face-to-face -to -face psychotherapy? Second, for whom are digital interventions effective? For example, do outcomes differ depending on the person's age, gender, or baseline depression severity levels? Third, what is the impact of the therapist in digital interventions? As mentioned earlier, interventions can be either guided or unguided. Do outcomes differ between the two? And does the qualification and experience of the person providing the support make a difference to outcomes? And finally, is there a difference in outcomes between efficacy and effectiveness trials? Efficacy trials are highly controlled trials where the inclusion criteria is often a lot tighter. For example, excluding patients with high severity levels or comorbidities. Partic participants typically self-refer and they may be paid to join or stay in a study. Whereas effectiveness trials are much more, well, those are the ones conducted in the real world. Real world healthcare settings where participants are much more representative of the general population. Now, as digital interventions start getting widespread adoption within healthcare settings, splitting out the two is critical if we're going to get an understanding of the real effect size. So in October 2020, we conducted a comprehensive search of the main publication databases, which yielded 83 studies of a randomized control trial of a digital intervention for the treatment of depressive symptoms. And these were our findings. Regarding the first research question, we found that overall, digital interventions were moderately more effective than control conditions. We also found no significant difference between outcomes in digital interventions and face-to-face -face psychotherapy. However, it's important to note that we found only three randomized controlled trials comparing the two. What's more, these were highly controlled lab-based studies. Regarding the second research question, for whom are digital interventions effective? We found that digital interventions were equally effective for males and females. However, when it came to age, we found that digital interventions were significantly less effective for children and adolescents than adults. And what about the therapist, the human clinician in all of this? Well, although some recent studies have suggested that there may be no difference in outcomes between guided and unguided interventions, we found that guided interventions had a significantly higher overall effect size than unguided interventions. Interestingly, however, we found no significant difference in outcomes when support was provided by a highly qualified clinician versus someone with low qualifications, such as a trainee or student. And finally, we found that overall, digital interventions are significantly more effective than treatment as usual in routine healthcare settings providing a meta-analytic answer to the open research question that has been challenged by individual trials in recent years. That said, outcomes in effectiveness trials were significantly lower than in efficacy trials, most likely due to the difference in adherence between the two. On average, only 25% of participants in real-world trials completed the full intervention versus 60% in efficacy trials. And this is important because of all the predictors in our analysis, completing the full intervention had the biggest impact on outcomes. Indeed, it was this finding on adherence in particular that provided the motivation for study two. Study two set out to assess the extent to which we could predict if an individual is likely to drop out of a digital intervention before completing it. The study was a secondary analysis of two large-scale randomized control trials of a guided digital intervention for the treatment of depressive symptoms in patients with chronic back pain. Now, depression is highly comorbid with individuals 
who have chronic back pain. It's often associated with poorer treatment outcomes and increased medical complications. So knowing whether digital interventions are feasible for all individuals with chronic back pain, or if there are certain characteristics such as pain severity that may increase the likelihood of dropout, is important if we're to allocate individuals to the right treatment format. In the original trials, 45% of patients dropped out of the intervention before, completed it, before completing it. So we asked the following research questions. First, can we predict which patients will drop out from their baseline characteristics, such as age, gender, and levels of depression and pain severity? Second, can we use data from the way that patients interact early on in the intervention to improve those predictions? And this is what we found. From the patient's baseline characteristics, lower levels of social support and both lower and higher age, so a quadratic effect, were associated with higher risk of dropout. And from the intervention usage data, the longer it took the patient to complete the first module, the more likely they were to drop out. Conversely, if they reported having had a negative event occur in the previous week, they were less likely to drop out. And finally, we found no significant influence of pain disability or depression severity on risk of dropout. Now, these findings are important for a number of reasons. First, the finding that neither pain disability nor depression severity levels were associated or with an increased risk of dropout, suggests that digital interventions may be acceptable for patients across all levels of pain disability or depression severity. Second, we demonstrated the feasibility of predicting dropout early on in the intervention based on a small subset of variables. Now, the majority of users who drop out of digital interventions typically do so after the first one or two modules, the so-called attrition phase, so being able to identify individuals at risk of dropout during this phase is precisely the time that it has the most value. So studies one and study two demonstrated the role that digital interventions could play in increasing access to treatment and how we might use technology to improve adherence and thus outcomes in these interventions. But what if we could use new technologies to identify people in advance of developing a disorder? More than 20% of people each year suffer from symptoms of depression but do not meet the full criteria for a clinical diagnosis, so-called subclinical depression. These individuals are four times more likely to develop a depressive disorder, yet less than half of cases are currently being identified. Successfully identifying these individuals and ensuring that they receive proper treatment could prevent more than 70% of the morbidity caused by depression. Well, it turns out that most of us own a device that could play a major role here. More than six billion people now have access to a smartphone device. And these devices are continuously generating an exhaust of data that may be valuable as digital biomarkers related to our mental health. Now, over the past decade, a relatively new field within healthcare has emerged called digital phenotyping to explore this potential. There's now a growing body of evidence showing how a number of features extracted from smartphone data correlate with symptoms of mental health. For example, GPS location data from smartphone sensors can be used to generate features related to movement patterns, such as the proportion of time spent at home or exercise, which in turn may then be associated with clinical states, such as depression. As with many new research endeavors, however, there have also been a lot of conflicting results with some studies finding relationships between digital biomarkers and symptoms of mental health, and others finding no association. So, as part of studies three and four, 
we developed a digital phenotyping app called Delphi and set out to see if we could replicate some of the findings in the field and whether we could identify other potential digital biomarkers related to depression and anxiety. In particular, I was particularly interested to see whether physiological data from a validated consumer wearable device, the Aura Ring, could be used to predict mental health symptoms. So we asked the following research questions. First, can location features derived from smartphone GPS be used to predict symptoms of depression and anxiety? Second, can measures of physical activity, sleep, and heart rate variability derived from the Aura Ring predict symptoms of depression and anxiety? And finally, which digital phenotyping features, models, or combination of features have the strongest predictive power? In April 2020, we recruited 60 adults who owned an iPhone and Aura Ring and collected their data continuously across a four-week period. We then assessed the extent to which the features extracted from this data could predict symptoms of depression and anxiety. And these were our findings. From the GPS data, we found that higher location variants, in other words, the more varied the locations a person visited across the four weeks, the lower their symptoms of depression. From the Aura Ring, we found that total sleep time and longer time in bed predicted greater depressive symptoms. We also found that the more someone woke up during the night, so-called wake after sleep onset, the higher their levels of anxiety. And finally, the most accurate models in predicting depression were achieved by combining the smartphone and wearable data. Now, although similar findings have been reported in lab-based studies using polysomnography, PSG, what is worthy of note here is that the findings in studies three of four were obtained in situ from real-world settings using consumer devices. And in so doing, I believe these studies highlight the potential that consumer wearables may provide in the coming years as scalable methods of identifying early warning signs of mental illness which in turn may then facilitate more timely intervention and hopefully prevention. So to conclude, I believe that together these four studies demonstrate the potential role that new technologies might play in addressing the burden of disease from depression both now and in the future. Evidence-based digital interventions could provide a scalable, cost-effective way to help meet the growing demand for treatment. As new technologies evolve, these interventions are likely to get smarter too, allowing us to get a better understanding of what works best for whom as we move towards personalized interventions and precision medicine in psychotherapy. In so doing, they may also provide us with a new experimental paradigm, one that allows us to move beyond the limits of treatment efficacy that have been a hallmark of the field for the past 50 years. Of course, there is still a tremendous amount of work to be done before that potential is realized. And digital interventions are not without their limitations. Not least are the challenges of adherence and implementation and how we ensure safe and equitable access to these technologies for all individuals. Topics which I look forward to discussing with my honorable opponent this afternoon. So on that note, I now call upon you, Professor Reiper, as the opponent appointed by the Faculty of Medicine to present your critical comments on my dissertation. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, first and all, for your really nice lay uh, talk. Welcome to the audience. 
uh, it is an honor for me, dear candidate, to start now the opposition and to reflect and discuss the results of your PhD. But before I will do so, I want to congratulate your supervisors, uh, your family, and all the others who have contributed to this beautiful uh, result. I won't uh, repeat everything you have said in your late talk about the importance of the prevention and treatment of depression, but I guess if I would ask the audience, do you know anyone in your network who is depressed? I think most of you will raise your hands. If I would ask you, do you know how much human suffering that accompanies depression uh, is taking place? I think all of you will know that either from an academic, a medical, or a family uh, perspective. Um, I think um, your thesis has contributed uh, to a large extent to bringing the field of digital mental health both from an academic and a routine care perspective one step further. As you have indicated, you have conducted a very large meta-analysis to assess, amongst others, the effectiveness of digital interventions for depression. You have looked at predictors of dropout in, um, by means of a secondary analysis of two large uh, clinical trials. And you have delved into one of my favorite domains, <laughs> but yet to be explored to a large extent, the world of digital phenotyping. In addition to that, your research, uh, your thesis has been very well uh, written. It was really uh, good uh, to understand, also when you are not a native speaker uh, of English. And I have to say, you didn't make it very easy for me, because your discussion section, specifically the limitations, you were so... <laughs> you wrote all the possible limitations uh, who could have been there. So. Thinking then about questions <laughs> is not always uh, the most easy one. My, my sincere compliments, I've really enjoyed uh, <coughs> uh, your thesis. Now, now we go into debate, and I don't know about the audience, but um, uh, Isaac's work has been already, how you say, reviewed by his supervisors, by the reviewers and editors of the journals where your papers are published uh, in, as well as by the, the reading uh, committee, so we will now engage more in a discussion than on a fine-grained detail you said on page this or that. So it is a, it is a discussion. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I will also be critical right. to your results. And to give you an idea about the structure of our discussion, I propose the following sequence. First, I will start with a couple of questions who are uh, points of attention uh, for all your papers, so there are a couple of generic issues which I think touch based upon the papers you have published. Then I will delve a bit in each individual uh, paper as such or chapter, and then I come back with some generic questions and the future uh, of digital mental health interventions uh, for depression and other common mental disorders as well. Now, I, is that okay for you? Sounds yep. great. Yeah. Okay. 